Hello, you're watching the Telecom TV Open RAN Summit. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content. The RAN Intelligent Controller, or RIC, is shaping up to be one of the innovation hotbeds of the Open RAN ecosystem. So how will RIC systems and their associated apps affect network operations and capabilities? And how can telcos maximize the value of the RIC for network efficiency gains? Well, to answer these questions, I'm joined on the program today by Lucia de Miguel Alberto, who is Senior Open RAN Manager at Vodafone, Constantine Polykronopoulos, Group Vice President, 5G and Telco Cloud at Juniper Networks, Azita Avani, CEO Americas for Rakuten Symphony, Richard McKenzie, Distinguished Engineer with BT, Rima Iontel, Chief Architect, TME Technology Strategy and Execution Office at Red Hat, and Patrick Kelly, Founder, Partner and Principal Analyst with Apple Door Research. Hello everyone, good to see you all and thanks so much for taking part in our discussion. So first question, just how big a deal is the RIC? Is the innovation hype that's surrounding RAN intelligent controllers actually justified? Constantine, from your perspective, do you see the hype here as justified? As you said, uh, it's the innovation ho uh, hotbed uh, guy. Uh, it's absolutely justified. I like to, uh, an analogy I like to use oftentimes is um, the RIC uh, being the operating system equivalent of the radio access network, right? If you recall the old days, um, we had applications customized on different hardware platforms, right? Then Linux came along and created this unification layer that we call today the operating system. We no longer talk about portability of applications, right? That's out of the box, it's expected to be there. So it's the same with uh, the radio intelligent controller. Uh, we no longer need to worry about who is the actual um, RU provider or um, with disaggregation DU, CU provider. We um, abstract basically all the capabilities of the radio. We give access to the capabilities of the radio access network and we enable now application development that is not uh, dependent on who is the, the RAN provider. So I think it's huge um, uh, in terms of the potential it can unleash for operators to bring in new innovation, to upgrade the networks in a seamless way, but most importantly, to create new business models that they can uh, monetize. Great, thanks very much. And, and Patrick, if I can come across to you, you know, as Constantine just said there, you know, the, the potential is, is huge, or it seems to be huge. Is this what you're, you're seeing from your perspective across the, the, the whole industry? Is, is the hype in this instance actually justified? I, I think so, Guy. Um, mostly uh, Constantine kind of hit on some of the key points, but I think it's also uh, the first time you have an open system to application developers and suppliers of the critical infrastructure. So you're able to control the performance of the radio access network uh, for the first time. Um, and quite frankly, some of the individual elements of the radio. Um, so what we're seeing um, as a market research firm is new entrants in the market, innovating much faster than the incumbent RAN infrastructure suppliers. Uh, and that would include startups, but also big companies. Uh, you've got Juniper, Red Hat, VMware, Intel, et cetera. They're very active in the market. Um, I think the the near real time RIC opens up, you know, finer level of control to the application developers and also uh, controlling the performance of the UE, the IoT devices and applications. So it's it's really a true microservice. Great, thanks very much, Patrick. And we'll we'll come on to the um, specifics of the, of the RIC and the types of RIC uh, in in a moment. But uh, first of all, Luthia, I'd like to come across to you be, because you know. Your job in an operator is, is focused on open RAN. So, you know, what's your belief in what the RIC can do? Yeah, although it's true that the, the standardization is not so mature to do a commercial deployment, uh, and also some vendors are a bit, I think, reluctant to open the interface to allow the RIC, 
the truth is that we are doing uh, now some uh, trials, even field uh, box uh, with the RIT system. So it's a reality that we can do innovative applications to improve the optimization, the operation and maintenance uh, at the end of the run. So from Vodafone perspective, we are eager and very supportive to push uh, this innovation. But I know that even some uh, governments, they are doing fundings to improve uh, or to do more applications. And the RIC is the enabler for this innovation in the run area. Thanks very much, Luthia. And Azita, if I can come across to you, um, the, the RIC obviously plays a, a, a big part in, in, in your focus as, as well. Um, I'll ask what you, what I've asked everybody else, and that is, is the hype in this instance actually justified? Uh, Guy, that's a great question. I would say yes and no. Uh, yes, in the sense that the bringing openness and uh, programmability to the RAN is is inevitable, right? We see that Open RAN itself and now with Rick as, as part of that. Uh, however, we need to also think about how do we make it in this sort of large scale deployment? So if you think about large scale deployment of Open RAN itself, we're still not quite there. I mean, of course, as as Rakuten, we have that as as a as the sort of like the only network that's RIC ready end to end. Um, and, and so the potential is certainly there and there's a lot of good work that has been done, but we need to think about how do we industrialize that? How do we industrialize the interfaces? How do we make sure that the app developers are able to come to this uh, uh, framework and how uh, the, the operators are able to certify them, onboard them in a very, uh, that, that can scale, right? It, it's not just enough to make sure that the functionality works, that we have a blueprint that works in a trial or in a small scale deployment. We have to make sure that uh, we are able to um, create models, uh, trust models for the applications to be able to be onboarded, for app developers to want to do, do this, for the RIC platform vendors to be able to make that a good business, and also for for the traditional RAN vendors also to be able to open this up and, and make sure that they do have open uh, interfaces that, that allow for this third-party innovation to come in. But in terms of, uh, the, uh, is it justified? Absolutely. I think... Uh, just in general, the radio access network, the fact that we have all these uh, the radio data streams that are coming in and we're able to analyze them, use AI and ML uh, models on them to be able to make, uh, to, uh, to make decisions, uh, to make predictions, that's absolutely uh, new and, and the hype around that is fully justified. Thanks so much, Azita. And as you say, there's still a lot of work to be done though, um, but there, there is certainly, um, a, a lot of uh, support and, and wide interest at the moment. Richard, did you want to come in and uh, add, add some comments based on uh, the initial sort of investigative work you've been doing at, at BT on the RIC? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the RIC we've identified as one of the key parts to to open run and making it work, um, and not just not just BT, but within the UK, the, the the government has looked at the benefits of open run. One of the key reasons for that is we get this re much more resilient supply chain. We're down to a limited number of RAN vendors. And so if, if we're going to address that by Open RAN, we have to make sure that Open RAN is multi-vendor capable. And to make sure we can coordinate all of these different components from different suppliers, we need to make sure that that controller is, is functional. So in terms of the importance of open interfaces, the, the, the RIC is the most important area to focus on. Um, it's it's also the the enabler for for so many things so as an operator it gives us a lot of um, control um to to differentiate from our competitors so from other operators we no longer have to pick a different vendor from our competitor we can we can pick and choose different components from um from the entire ecosystem combine those components to create um, the services we want for our customers and we can create customized services um, by using all of the capabilities and innovation that is available across the ecosystem. So yeah, it's, it's a challenge and we're not there yet. It's maturing fast, but um, it's, it's so important. 
Great, thanks very much, Richard. So uh, positive, positive news all around there for for the RIC community. Um, I, I want to come on to an, another question, um, and that's really to emphasise that there's two types of RIC when we talk about the RIC. Um, should the focus of network operators be on the near real time RIC and the associated X apps? And Patrick, you mentioned uh, the near real time RIC earlier. Um, or is the non real time RIC and the R apps equally as important at this stage? And Rima, could I uh, come across to you for, for, for your views on this, please? Yes, absolutely. Um... In my opinion, uh, service providers should definitely want both working in accord with each other in their network, um, where XAPs uh, can enhance the RAN spectrum efficiency per uh, radio unit in basically real time on under second basis. You can use non real time RIC as it's part of SMO uh, and it can react to predicted future network states. And our apps armed with AI ML can apply policy and it can make adjustments to achieve network-wide optimization. So um, you can use non-real-time RIC and the R apps to track long-term uh, trends. And uh, you can apply closed loop automation to react to those trends. So uh, you can have different types of R apps that can analyze different types of data um, uh, collected, collected and uh, provide visibility even into the state of the network overall. Um, so you want to know um, what type of optimizations you can apply, not just on the immediate state of the network, but what you've been seeing across historical data and that's where our apps can help you as well uh, you can isolate folds you can apply more efficient and uh, optimize for performance or for operations depending on you so that's why i think both of them are extremely Thanks very much, Rima, for, for those insights. And uh, I think the industry hasn't helped itself with some uh, very confusing vocabulary here. But um, if I could come back to, to Richard first, um, near real-time RIC and X apps or non-real-time RIC and, and, and R apps, what's your take on this? Well, we've been doing a lot of our work um, on RIC development through the Telecom Infra project and the, the, um, the TIPRIA um, group in particular. We've identified the key use cases where we want the industry to focus on and to sort of reflect the the, the maturity of the industry and, and individual X apps and R apps we've been issuing bronze, silver and gold badges. And what we found actually when we initially um, described the use cases, we had certain ones where we said this sounds like near real time, this one sounds like non real time. And what we found when people were putting in applications for badges, we found that some of the vendors disagreed with us. They had different ways to implement, um, to, to achieve the goals that we were assuming could, were best achieved by one one element of the RIC. They were assuming it's it's actually the other way around. So, so actually we, what we did was we changed the description of the use cases. So we don't specify which RIC it has to be. Um, and that makes a lot of sense. If there's um, a chance for innovation, um, for more competition, we allow that. So we've actually changed our mind several times when we, when we think about each individual use case. There's often a role, for whatever use case, there's often a role where you say that the near real time can take care of this, these actions and the non real time can do these other ones. But sometimes we're finding that it's one or the other. So certainly we don't exclude either. We, we want to um, develop solutions across both. Um, as a general principle, we sort of say near real time, we're expecting anything that's going to be doing anything with the scheduler, um, that, that's better implemented in the near real time RIC. Um, but then if we want to get the real benefits of AI, um, we want to be connecting to our, our non real time RIC to the AI um, elements. And so from a from a starting point, you usually know whether it's it's best, best suited to non real time or near real time. But as you go into the details, you actually find you're changing your mind. So <laughs> um, we, we definitely want both. 
That's, that's f absolutely fascinating, Richard. Uh, thanks very much for that. Uh, Constantine, if I could uh, come to you next. Is, is it a case of focusing on, on one, maybe the, the near real-time RIC first, um, or, or are we, should we be focusing on both together? Absolutely uh, both. Uh, Richard uh, and Rima summed it up very well, and they gave compelling reasons as to why we need both, right? If you consider a network that can span an entire uh, nation, right? A huge uh, geographical area. Now, if you uh, consider what the RIC is, uh, you know, brings to the to the forefront, is the ability to do optimization, um, dynamic optimization, right? So, if we consider, for example, congestion, uh, the particular uh, region, right? The latency within which the time span within which uh, you know the RIC needs or the application needs to react is very limited. So there are practical reasons concerning um, latency, how quickly you can react uh, as an you know as an application. Uh, there are also architectural issues that uh, necessitate both the near real time that has responsibility for only a part of the region, right? Uh, let's say you know cell sites in one particular region uh, of London, uh, and the non real time rig that has purview of the entire network that can span thousands of miles. So, uh, you know, you cannot do uh, all types of optimization by having one or the other, right? Uh, think of the near real-time rig as uh, having a regional responsibility, uh, running perhaps a dozen or so uh, microcells, and non-real-time rig having uh, a global view of the entire network. Uh, and as Richard said, that's where in RIMA, that's where you can... Um, leverage the power of um, uh, machine learning driven applications right so we need both absolutely we need both so oran was very wise in terms of architecting the radio intelligent controller as near real time non real time thanks very much constantine and azita what's your view here yes so guy first of all i totally agree with you that the naming of this should be uh, should have been maybe a little different because the non uh, real time we call X, uh, the real time we call X apps, and the non real time uh, we call R apps, which you would think is the, the other way around. But, anyways, I think uh, as my uh, colleague said, it's very important that the operators focus on both. However, uh, I think practically speaking, um, the, the, there might be a, a sort of a, like a the sequence of events of how this would happen. I think in terms of things that they have in common is that first the operator will have the uh, the, the control over the, the data that comes in um, from from the RAN system and whether it's the uh, the fine grain uh, sort of X apps getting down to the, uh, the very low levels of radio and being able to do scheduling, resource management, um, like turning on and off the various RF channels and so forth, whether at that level or at the higher level uh, across the entire network, looking at things holistically. So they're both very powerful and and um, and useful for the operators. So the first thing is to getting used to the idea of owning that uh, that amount of data that comes in and being able to uh, either uh, on their own or with partners, third parties, being able to analyze and take advantage of that. So that kind of applies to both of these uh, non-real-time and real-time uh, apps. In, in addition, I think uh, uh, the industrializing this entire um, set of X app and R apps to saying, like, what would it take to, to bring these applications uh, on board and making sure that that whole lifecycle management with apps, you know, you you uh, put an app out and you try it maybe in a certain uh, region. And then if it works great, you roll it out to the rest of the, uh, the network or you can uh, reverse it, pull it back. So being able to do those kinds of operational uh, operationalizing uh, the, the use of X apps and R apps are very important. Um, however, in the uh, practically speaking, the non real time uh, part of this would be, um, I would say, easier and might feel safer for the operators to go to because uh, you know basically you've got these uh, business policy decisions that you're um, translating into the RAN configurations and policies. And as Richard said, there's not a clear line between real time and non real time, but uh, that feels. Uh, 
like the, the higher level would be easier and safer to go to. And then uh, after that, the non uh, real time, the real time, sorry, the near real time uh, RIC then involves that fine grained tuning of the RAN and it's very uh, sensitive to the latencies and, and the performance and that part of it uh, will uh, will come naturally after that um, uh, even though the working on both at the same time is important I think um, the way that it will roll out uh, the the, the non-real time will probably go first and uh, as the operators feel more comfortable with that and the the near real time uh, will come later and then also the uh, being able to go um, cro uh, across various vendors on near real time would be more complex and more sensitive. So that part will also uh, come to bear a little later. Great. Thanks very much, Azita. And um, having said that both are really important, I do want to focus uh, our next area of discussion on the near real time, Rick, if I could. Um, and I want to ask, what kind of innovation is possible with a near real time RIC that isn't already in the hands of the network operator? In other words, do they actually need a RIC? And Constantine, I'll come to you in a moment, but uh, let me go to Patrick for, for your comments first. Yeah, Guy. Um, so we've been kind of dancing around the edges on, on this. Um, and I think one of the big things with the near time RIC is uh, increased network automation and um, probably more specifically intelligent resource management. Uh, Constantine was talking a little bit about that. So with the, um, with the near time, uh, near real time RIC uh, operators, what they can do is um, effectively manage and allocate network resources based on the real time requirements that they have. Um, so, you know, examples would be dynamic spectrum allocation, load balancing, you have interference management, things of that nature that are all important. Um, this this really was not possible before uh, the introduction of the RIC. Um, and you know, a couple other couple other examples would be network slicing, uh, something that the industries talk quite a bit about. Uh, the near real time uh, RIC can be deployed for quality of service network slicing, as an example. So you get um, potential revenue monetization. Uh, uh, possibilities uh, where you're actually generating uh, incremental revenue based on the quality of the service. Um, one other area just related to service innovation is um, the introduction of new services in the RAN. So we talked earlier about uh, opening it up for application developers um, and where you can tie this real-time quality of service back to, uh, you know, a, a you know, a monetization model or a package that's being offered, I think is uh, is a game changer for the industry. Yeah, that's really interesting, Patrick. Thanks for, for bringing that up. Uh, Constantine, I promise to come across to you. What's your views? Do, do operators need a RIC? You know, what's possible with the, the near real-time RIC that they don't already have? Um, I don't need to say anything more. Patrick uh, summed it up perfectly and he hit all the key notes. I'll give you an example. Consider, for example, a, uh, a sports venue that is being serviced by a number of cells, right? And all of a sudden you have an emergency situation in that sports you know, venue area. Today, the network is rigid. You cannot change PDU allocation from one, one type of, uh, you know, one class of users to another class of users. You cannot shift the network to give priority to first responders, right? The near real-time rig enables that in a seamless way. Very powerful use case, right? That can be implemented with admission control and uh, traffic steering. Um, as Patrick said, SLA assurance for network slicing necessitates the near real-time rig and you know reciprocal applications. There are there is a litany of use cases that make the near real-time rig uh, a necessity in the network. Um, we can go on and on, but I'll stop here. Thanks, Constantine. Yes, um, that's a great example. And uh, as you say, that the, there are a lot of examples we could we could pick on, and I'm sure we'll start to see those um, in the months ahead. Well, let me come across next to Rimmer for for your views on this. Um, I just wanted to add like one note. I completely agree with uh, the previous two speakers. 
uh, on the importance of near time rig. I just wanted to give another example that rig allows you to use expensive resource, which is spectrum, in a much more efficient way. And that's one of its biggest selling points, I think, for me, because even looking to 6G, where spectrum is become, becoming even more important, being able to do more with what you have is going to become uh, crucial, and that's where the rig is going to help. Indeed, yes. Thanks very much for that, Rima. And uh, Azita, let's uh, come across to you as well. Yes, yeah, so Guy, I, I agree with uh, what uh, Patrick and Constantine and Rima said. And just to build on that, it is uh, possible for the uh, RAN uh, vendors today to add the, this capability that we were talking about into their uh, into their software today and bring it up to the network. Uh, however, that will take a long time, and that innovation cycle is not working as fast. So, so a big part of what are we getting with real-time rig versus uh, what we could have today with the traditional networks is that innovation velocity. It's just much faster to uh, bring innovation to the network uh, using the RIC framework and bringing in third-party applications. Great. Thanks so much, Azita. Well, look, let, let's try and uh, wrap this up and, and round this out a little bit. Um, and um, Richard, if I can come across to you to start off our, our next question area because i'd like to ask for an operator what are the main benefits to be gained from deploying rick systems yes well the the most important one for us is it's given us that ability to differentiate from from our competitors um so i've said this already but it does need emphasizing open run is not just about competition healthy competition between vendors it's making sure there's that healthy competition between operators as well and and this is what we want to this is what we want to do um, and then when we start looking at the services we want to support for 5g once we go beyond just enhanced mobile broadband we need to be able to um, reconfigure the network as quickly and easily as possible so building on the the answers from the, from the, the previous questions you know we really want that flexibility that when when there's a new service that we want to deploy or a new situation arises we want to be able to reconfigure quickly and easily um, and the RIC gives us the tools to do that quickly. Um, the, the other aspect actually is, is around, you know, how many of those tools. So um, normally we have a feature set. So whichever run vendor we pick, they have a feature set. It's fully optimized and they've done a really good job to get the best um, out of their radios with, with the features that they're developing. Um, and so that is um, a tough task to try and outperform that an optimized single vendor run solution. But what we get is this much larger feature set. We can then use any of the capabilities from anywhere in the ecosystem, piece them together to create this um, this new service via the, the near real time and non real time RICs. Um, and and that, that really will give us over time um, a larger feature set and so the, the potential to outperform traditional run. So that, that's also another really valuable thing that we see about the RIC. Um, and when you start thinking of some of the earlier examples, you know, Spectrum is still one of the largest um, expenses for operators. If we can improve, and, and not just the expense, but it, it's a finite resource. If we can improve that spectral efficiency, even just a little bit, um, that's got huge value. And we can do a lot of that via, via the RIC. Thank you, Richard. And uh, as you said earlier, it's not lose sight of the fact that uh, operators are about offering services and delivering services. You must remember the services and comes back to the customer. Uh, Patrick, let me come across to you first, because we've got quite a few of you wanting to come in on, on, on this question. So, Patrick, what, what do you see as the, the main benefits uh, to be gained for operators? Yeah, Guy, um, this is a very, uh, the telco industry is very capital intensive. So uh, what, you know, some of the things Richard pointed out, better capital, efficiency ratios, uh, better spectrum efficiency ratios is is enormous uh, with using this technology. Um, we talked about new revenue generating services. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of growth in the telco industry, so this presents an opportunity. We talked about things like slicing, uh, opening up uh, the ecosystem, uh, so fostering an open ecosystem that would promote things like network as a service. Uh, Rick clearly provides an angle and a capability here 
Um, and then one of the things we haven't talked about, and I know guy, you, you guys have covered it at Telecom TV is sort of energy management, energy efficiency. So I think uh, it supports green, you know, a green ecosystem and sustainability policies. Th those would be for me, the, the big, uh, the big benefits. Thanks so much, Patrick. And Rima, what are the operator benefits that you see? Well, I actually wanted to bring up the same point that Patrick just covered about energy efficiency because it's very close to my heart. I've been a lot on it lately. Uh, and it is one of the big benefits uh, that is expected to come from utilizing RIC and the network. Because if you look at the recently released or an alliance list of use cases, um, they have several use cases that are specifically addressing energy efficiency and power optimization. And RIG plays key role in those because it allows you to dynamically, um, you know, turn off carriers, change RF frequencies, uh, make other adjustments just based on, uh, you know, power consumption. And uh, harking back to the topic of why we need our apps, um, you can use our apps to track uh, trends in utilization of the network. And based on that, you can decide to turn off certain carriers, certain cells, um, change certain frequencies, um, you know, force handoffs, uh, you know, to balance the network, etc. all uh, in an effort to achieve best power efficiency. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, as you say, energy efficiency and, and lowering power consumption as, as well, so critical at the moment. Constantine, let me come across to you. You know, what do you see as the, the main benefits for operators for deploying RIC systems? Um, all the previous speakers uh, address some of the key, the most important benefits, right? I'll stay uh, on, on two examples. Um, one is um, what Richard mentioned earlier, the ability of the operators to differentiate um, as well and build their own applications. That's, that's the, you know, a, a new capability, right? That Rick, uh, brings to the forefront. Um, you can think of uh, BT, for example, or Vodafone building their own differentiated applications that may, they may or may not want to open up to other competitors, right? Um, if we think of uh, network slicing that Patrick, that Patrick mentioned, um, I expect network slicing to be truly a a, a key, a catalyst for uh, new business opportunities uh, for operators. Think of uh, utilizing network slicing to enable private mobile networks, enterprise services. Uh, that again, uh, cannot be done without the near real-time rig being able to shift uh, radio resources dynamically on demand, right? And guarantee SLA that you attach to that particular network slice uh, for that enterprise. Um, spectrum sharing. Again, um, another way to leverage uh, your investment in Spectrum uh, by monetizing, uh, you know, Spectrum sharing through Spectrum sharing uh, in areas of your uh, region as a network operator where you can afford to, you know, enable others to use your Spectrum where it's not utilized. Again, there is a long list of possibilities and applications that address both uh, new revenue generation for operators, better utilization of their investment, CAPEX, uh, as well as reduction in OPEX. So I think, you know, if you look at it holistically, the value proposition of the radio intelligent controller is truly compelling. It's going to take a little bit of time, but I think all of these benefits are going to manifest themselves in the next few years. Great. Thanks, Constantine. Well, we need to move forward to uh, our final talking point. And Luthia, I'd like to bring you uh, back into this one, if I can. Um, and that is the benefits that we've been discussing on the panel. Will they only be realized once the RIC platforms and the associated apps become truly interoperable? And in which case, you know, how far away do you think we are from this actually happening? Uh, not really. I, I think that the RIC as the core of the run automation is an staged process where you begin to prioritize and use cases. I think it was commented previously, the energy saving, the spectrum optimization operations, and to create it some 
uh, ad hoc or I think proprietary solution agreements between the operator, the vendors, the developers, and to create it with a commitment, and this is the key part, uh, to move these ad hoc solutions to a standard solutions. So the automation is an stage, so you have to go step by step with a rig. And uh, although we are a bit far to have um, a full interoperable uh, rig, uh, I think, network, uh, but we are very close to have use cases. I, I think it's a reality. You have to install a rig. Uh, we have it in, I think, in Sunfield in Turkey. And um, to create some use case, they can be basic and uh, traffic steering or more innovative at uh, multimedia, I think, a spectrum optimization and begin to test it. So I think it's a reality that you can do something now. And of course, when we have the network completely interoperability, we have more and more use cases and more competitive and more innovations. At the end, we are looking for the benefits of innovation. We can do something and later to open the, at the end, uh, the network for more um, uh, developers to have a truly democratic size, the network. Thank you, Luthia. You, you said there that, you know, it's all about innovation and, and the interoperability is already starting. You also said, uh, I think we, we need to standardize more. Did, did I hear that correctly? Yeah, because at the end, the, the, the interface is standardization and not fully mature. As we commented initially, uh, some interfaces that are required for the, the rig, especially I think the E2 and the A1 uh, are evolving. And this is the reason that you don't have it truly opera uh, operable, the networks. Uh, similar to some interfaces for the SMO as the O1 as the O2 are still being in the process of the standardization in the Oran Alliance. But meanwhile, we can have some pre-standard solutions where we can be able to do some uh, use cases as energy saving or uh, some optimization. Great. Thank you very much, Luthia. We've got some more comments coming in on this question. So, Rima, let me come across to you first. Um, I wanted to uh, address something that Lucia just mentioned uh, in terms of standardization and the interfaces that are not completely mature. So one of the ways to uh, sort of control it, if you're deploying something that is pre-standard or not quite standard, is to make sure it's uh, software upgradable. Uh, and that's using the platform under uh, your RICS in su such a way that, uh, you know, allows you to upgrade your RICS almost seamlessly. And uh, that is one way of mitigating that problem. And the other aspect also that she mentioned, and I wanted to address, um, having more innovation means uh, you have to have more developers dedicated to this space. And right now, uh, I think there's a shortage of developers who are familiar with telco applications. Uh, Radio Access Network is a very complex entity. Um, service providers are usually very protective of their network for very good reason. Uh, so where are we, we expecting this innovation to come from? Because right now what I'm seeing, unfortunately, is all the RIC providers that people are working with, the testing, a traditional NAPs, traditional network equipment vendors, all the incumbent vendors, are they really the good source of innovation? I mean, not to put them down, of course, but we've seen in other areas that main uh, source of innovation is all the startups, all the hobbyists, etc., who come up with these like cr crazy weird applications that then take over the world. Are we allowing this type of ecosystem to foster right now in this space? Uh, I think that's a really important uh, area to address as well. Yes, yeah, a very good comment, Rima, you know, um, and, and, and nicely put as well. Um, well. It looks like everyone wants to, to comment on this final question. So, uh, Patrick, let me come across to you next. Yeah, I'll make it quick, Guy. I mean, so we've been keying off some important points, even with standards. So you have pre-standards. 
even when you get to full standards, you've you, you've sort of got this disaggregation of the RAN, um, and the the RIC is a key you know key asset there. Um, but one of the things I think uh, is a concern, at least for a lot of the operators we talk to, is this sort of robust design testing and continuous monitoring of the the RIC and the overall network infrastructure. So, you know, this collaboration not only between the operators and the vendors and the app developers, we think that's essential to really uh, make this initiative successful. So we're talking about flexibility, we're talking about new re revenue generating services, et cetera, but that whole continuous test and life cycle is a key key asset um, in the RAN as it becomes more disaggregated. So you, you sort of get scalability, you got fault tolerance, um, you even have some issues around network security. And you know this will go well beyond the time that we have on the show, but there's a, there's a lot of uh, peeling back of the onion to make sure you know when we're prime time that everything's uh, working as it should uh, when you're you know when you've got consumers and enterprises expecting these services to be you know five nine six nines reliable. Yeah, indeed. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, let me go straight across to Constantine next for for, for your views. Yes, uh, interoperability is key. There's no question about it. And uh, I think the big step forward would be for the traditional maps to adhere to the ORAN um, interfaces. If we achieve that, right, if they support the ORAN mandated interfaces, I think we'll be halfway there or more than halfway there. Uh, I also want to um, uh, comment on what uh, Rima said. I beg to defer. If you look at what what is happening in the industry, you have a host of startups um, coming with new applications, new capabilities for the run. That was not the case, you know, five years ago. And traditional NEPs are not fast at moving in uh, in adapting and, and innovating on the radio intelligent controller uh, front, right? Uh, the innovators are non-traditional NEPs like Juniper, um, you know, VMware, others, you know. Um, so I, I don't think I have the same view. I think the RIC and Oren have enabled an ecosystem that allows new startups. There is a host of them. We all know them that address spectral efficiency, energy efficiency, etc. So that's fantastic news for the for the uh, you know industry and and our you know ecosystem. Yeah, thanks, Constantine. Uh, I, I do think our definition of incumbent uh, suppliers is, is is changing quite a bit now. It's like, what point are you a starter? At what point are you a new entrant? What point are you are you, are you traditional? Um, but you know, from what we're hearing already, there's there's um, a lot of innovation going on. But it seems like we, there's there's more we can do as an industry. Um, and uh, I do want to look a little bit more at the intro interoperability issue. I will come to Richard in a moment, but first, let me go across to Azita. Yes, Guy, so uh, it's very important to realize that uh, things can work on a small deployment, but if you want to scale this, two things we need to definitely um, work on. First, as what uh, Patrick was saying in terms of operationalizing this, how do we bring up these innovations so that it, it's easy to uh, try this like in a new market, roll it back if needed. Uh, just that whole life cycle management of whether it's X apps, R apps is super, super important. The other thing that's very near and dear to my heart is what Rima said about enabling new startups to come in to this uh, RAN uh, part of the network. Because I, I've, I've been a, a startup myself, worked with tons of startups in my career, and it's really hard to be a telecom startup. And here, what we're saying is that we have these uh, X app developers, R app developers, but they're not, they need to be nurtured. That whole ecosystem has to be put together. And as telco, we don't have great history of making that easy. So, for example, uh, if you think about IMS, you know, IMS was supposed to be another one of these frameworks that we bring uh, various innovation from third parties. And the thing that we uh, forget to uh, pay a lot of attention to is that why, as an, as an app developer, what is my incentive to come to this? How easy it is for me to get onboarded? How easy it is for me to get certified? Do I, do I get certified with the operator, with the RIC vendor? How do I recertify? How do I uh, make money out of this? How big is the market? So it's super important that we think about how do we 
start this ecosystem? How do we cultivate it? How do we nurture it? Because at the end of the day, that's what this RIC is all about, is bringing outside innovation into telcos so we run much more efficiently, reduce costs, uh, become more efficient with energy, all the great things that RIC uh, offers. Yeah, thanks, Azita. And there's room for everyone to play in this ecosystem. Now, we started this final round of questions with the views of Luthea at Vodafone. So let me go across now to Richard uh, at BT. Thanks. Yeah, there's um, lots of great points already made. Um, so I'll, I'll try and focus on a, a few additional ones. So certainly we've got a healthy um, potential supply chain for, for X apps and R apps. Um, and, and we mentioned there's the incumbent vendors. There's the traditional SON vendors who can repackage their existing products as, as X apps and R apps. Um, and then we talk about the startups and the, the smaller companies who have one specialist niche area. These are the really exciting opportunities where we, we hope to see um, lots of deployments in, in, the, in the trials that we're, we're planning with, um, not just with BT, but across the entire TIP community um, this year. Um, and there's there's one other um, X app R app um, developer, which is of course the the operators themselves. Um, we know our customers as well as anybody, and we might and we've got an architecture there where we might be in a position to to actually be the the X app or R app developer. Um, when we talk about the interoperability, ideally we want plug and play, um, but it's not essential. What we need to make sure is it's possible to integrate something. So if it requires one week to integrate something into an into a RIC, we might just have to accept that. Ideally, we want it to be plug and play, but it's it's not it's not the end of the world. What we do need to make sure is um, that that things become functional. And when we when we actually deploy these X apps and R apps, are they achieving their objectives? Um, and we've already seen that in in the trials we've done. So we've so for example, the the RE five G project, we've looked at. Um, coverage capacity optimization, interference mitigation, massive MIME optimization, um, and energy saving. And so they've all got different objectives. And what we're seeing is those those X apps um, can all achieve their their stated objective. The type of interoperability we also need to focus on is what if we stick all of those X apps and a few more into the same RIC, which have got different objectives, and we need to make sure that they coordinate with one another. So there's there's that level of interaction between the X apps, um, and that's a layer of um, interoperability that we we do. We're, we've already identified it, but we haven't fully addressed it yet. So that might be that there's um, a, an overriding moderator X app or R app, um, but there's there's a number of ways we can address this. But that's that's one of the focus areas we've got at the moment, and and that's that's what we truly need um, to make sure that we have um, interoperability for a for a multi vendor deployment. Great points. Thanks very much, Richard. And I think we've just got a, a, a couple of seconds to come to two of our guests for some uh, some quick responses. Uh, Constantine, did you want to pick up on, on what was said there, I think? Right. Uh, Richard hit on a very important point, right? And um, Oran specifies APIs, but it doesn't tell you how to build your rig. Um, so we take pride at Juniper Networks for uh, being the first ones in the industry to uh, address this problem that Richard identified by providing a conflict manager that, that captures conflicts and mitigates conflict resolution, right? Which is extremely important because two different applications may try to configure to touch configuration, let's say on the DU, um, um, on the same parameters, right? So how do you address that conflict and how do you mitigate it? It's extremely important for the uh, success of, uh, of, uh, of the RIC. Thanks, Constantine. And just got time to go across to Rimmer as well. I was actually going to say exact same thing, except for the Juniper part. I was going to say that we are lacking a standard effective conflict mitigation mechanism. Uh, and uh, that's one area that still needs to be addressed. So that's it. That's all I had to say. Rima, thanks very much indeed. We're leaving the panel now with a lot of questions we need to work on and develop, and I'm sure we will do just that. But we must leave it there for now. Thank you all very much for taking part in the discussion today. Absolutely fascinating to hear all your views. Now, if you are watching this on day two of our Open RAN Summit, then please do send us your questions. I'm sure you have lots of questions and we'll answer them in our live Q&A show, which is coming up very soon. 
And don't forget to view the other roundtables and keynotes in this year's event. For now though, thanks for watching and goodbye.